What's going on you guys? So this is my 2015 Mustang. It's a turbo LS swap Mustang and I spent quite a while trying to figure out a good rear mount radiator setup on it to keep it from overheating and I finally figured it out. So I'm going to tell you how I did it. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to pull up one of my data logs from one of my runs and kind of run you through one of my passes to show you the actual temperature and operating of the cooling system and where it sits, how much boost we're running, RPM range and all that. So I'm going to kind of show you guys that right now. Okay, so here's one of my data logs from one of my runs. So we are going to be starting here at 2 minutes 40 seconds. And we have RPM graphed in orange, coolant temp in yellow, and boost pressure in blue. Just to show that this was an actual run. So we can go through here. You can see we're starting around 167 degrees in this pole. As we were running the car, coolant temp obviously is going to start going up. Let's just scroll over here. As you can see, you know, we're running the car all the way up to, you know, 6,500 RPM, running... 13, 14 pounds of boost, and we're going to keep going with this, and you'll see coolant temps start to level off a little around 190. So right there, we're up at like 196 degrees near the end of that pull, and then we get right back into it. So running the car again, 14 pounds of boost, 6,500 RPM, and it looks like right there, we're holding off the rev limiter for a bit at the end of the run, but we kind of level off right around 197 degrees seems to be our average uh, level off under high load. Now you can see when I let off, stuff will start to heat soak a little bit, temps will go back up, and then we'll run it again, and it'll kind of just sit there. So we're sitting right around 204 at the end of a run that was, let's see, 410. So yeah, 240 to 410, so roughly a minute and a half long run. Yep, so that was a minute and a half long run, and it got up to 210 degrees. Or, a minute and a half long run, and it got up to 204 degrees. So, 204 degrees actually isn't even really that hot. Standard operating temperature for an LS is over 200 degrees. It cools off relatively quickly, so I can get back out there. Uh, this was a back-to-back -back run, as you can see. Uh, temp dropped back down to 165 relatively quick. Uh, the data logger does not track time in between i'm pretty sure this wasn't more than a couple minutes of sitting if that even usually temps will drop down very rapidly now to say this car doesn't overheat overheating is a relative term depending on what you consider overheating uh, for me i think when a car gets up to 220 it's getting a little bit hot uh, overheating would be around 230 in my opinion this car rarely gets over 200 degrees now now I'm going to walk you guys through the steps and show you what I did to this car to make it stay so cool and work so efficiently. So for starters, the factory water pump was completely eliminated. We went over to 12AN lines off of the actual engine block right there. And you can see that they kind of come together in these Y blocks. And they run into hard lines that go over and down under the car. Now the steam port routing on this is a crossover in the front here. So this is where our steam port is. Any high air or any air that gets trapped in the motor will come into this line here. And then that line goes right into this radiator hose. That radiator hose is the return. So that returns the air all the way back into the radiator. So now we're gonna take this thing up in the air and show you guys the coolant line routing. So up under the car here, you can see these are my coolant hoses right here. And they are one and a half inch hoses. And you can kind of see, I lost my flashlight, I don't know where it went. So you can see the hard lines right there. That kind of snakes past the steering shaft. And then we have this hard line right there that goes up under the motor mount. But those are the those are the two hard lines coming off of the motor and then they go down under the car and then they route back to here. So we have our two one and a half inch hoses 
that come up under here. We put a nice little skid plate here to protect the box, but we have an aluminum box that the lines go into to come up into the car. Once they're in the car, they there's an enclosure there and they don't run very far. Then they come back out right here and then they go back up and in in the rear here. Uh, this was primarily done just for the, the ergonomics of the routing and make it all simpler and easier. But there are enclosure panels up there as well on the uh, inside of the car there. So that's, a, that's pretty simple, pretty obvious. You need to have hoses run all the way back. But I just wanted to show you that I am running one and a half inch hose all the way to and from. Now you can do it with hard line, you can do it with soft line. I've seen guys run 16 AN hose. I personally don't have any experience with doing hose that small, but one and a half inch seems to work really well for me. Now, one thing I find to be a common misconception when doing rear mount radiators is that you need tons of air ducting and air flow into the actual radiator in order to keep it cool. Now, you do need open air to be able to move, but as for the ducting, it's not nearly as important as having really good fans. Now with a rear mount radiator setup, you are kind of limited to space. So with my setup, what I did was basically measure out the biggest radiator I could possibly fit in the back of my car. So mine actually stands straight up vertically. I don't remember the exact dimensions, but it was the biggest radiator I could fit in there. Now up in the top here, this is the steam port off of the actual radiator which comes up over to the coolant expansion tank. Make sure your coolant expansion tank is sitting higher than your actual radiator. Otherwise, you know, this is gonna be the highest point to trap air. You actually wanna make this the highest point to trap air. So expansion, overflow recovery, one unit. It's a Canton Racing product, it's actually really nice, but just make sure that's higher than the actual core. You want this to be the highest point in your system. Now, something else that I do is I put a thread on non-pressure cap on the actual radiator that is only for filling and bleeding the system once it's filled and bled out this cap goes on it stays on it doesn't leak I don't like using radiators that have the twist lock uh, pressure relief caps on them I like to only have one pressure relief cap in the entire system because it limits points of failure in the system and this one right here is 21 psi and it seems to work great. So back to the flow section of this. So our return line comes over across and up. So we're getting the hot coolant from the engine up across here. Any air that's getting in this is gonna be pushed into here and caught by the tank. And then there is a hose. And then out from the bottom of the tank right here, returns into the bottom of the radiator where the coolant is pulled back in through to the water pump which is in there so you can kind of see our water pump right there underneath the tank pulling the coolant out of the radiator and sending it back up to the front and that is a Messier 55 gallon per minute pump works super efficiently as for the actual radiator core I started with an AFCO single pass radiator core so coolant comes in here across down to the bottom and then exit but what i did to this core is i plated it so that it would be a triple pass core that way the coolant has to go in here over across down over across down over across and then out so that way the coolant actually has to pass through the core three times before it returns to the motor now what that does is it helps dissipate the heat and cool more efficiently. So when you have a single pass, basically you can get hot spots in the core that won't be cooling as easily, but if you, if you narrow down the section of path, all that hot coolant is gonna have to go through that top part, and then it's all gonna come back down through the center as it's getting cooler, and then go back down through the bottom and get even cooler. So it's actually gonna cool down more efficiently and from my experience, it works really well. So I do have a video on when I did the triple pass conversion on this radiator. So I will link that down in the description. Now, like I was saying earlier, a lot of people focus a lot on building crazy ducting and 
you know, Nacodox and air scoops and all kinds of stuff to get airflow into the radiator core. But I found that's not nearly as important as having good fans. So as long as you have an open area to create pressure differentials that can suck air in through here, you're gonna be fine. So just don't enclose this off. Make sure you have good room in front of and behind the radiator. And back here, obviously this is completely opened up so we can get tons of airflow out. And we do have a bunch of room in there to get airflow in. Now, one of the key things that I changed on this that made me almost never have coolant issues ever again was the fans. A good set of fans go a really long way. Now, something I do to actually help with being able to fit two large fans on there is I build a V shroud. Now, if you're wondering what I meant by V shroud, well, it's a shroud in the shape of a V. Now what that does is it gives you more surface area this way and this way to fit two large fans. So normally I would only be able to fit two 12 inch fans on this core or maybe 11 and a half I think it was. But with a V shroud I can fit two 14s. So in the back here we have two 14 inch derail fans and each one of these pull about 2800 CFM. So you know we are over 5000 CFM of airflow and they made a huge difference. So before I put these fans on, we did have some overheating issues. Car would get up to 225, 230, 240 degrees if I ran it hard enough. But with these fans on, I actually had to change my fan kick on temperature to 170 degrees because if I didn't do that, this thing would never get over like 180 or 170 even sometimes. So we changed the, the temp kick on to 170 and now usually it'll run up to like 190, 200 degrees and that's still super safe. And if we ever ran into an issue where we thought it was getting a little hot, we could just turn our fan temp kick on a little bit lower and that would give us a little bit more headroom for temperature. But right now the way it's set up, it seems to work perfectly. So back here, we're also taping off around the fans. I should really tape this off as well because what this is doing is creating a pressure differential. So this is ideally low pressure here and then you have high pressure on this side. So low pressure, high pressure, high pressure moves to low. That's the way it works. This is technically a leak. So with this sealed off, it would be even more efficient. But then we also went and like, you know, just kind of capped off semi back here on that stuff. And I mean, it's really a simple setup. There's nothing super crazy to it. Um, that's that's pretty much it as far as I can I can think of right now. So I mean I can go ahead and turn these fans on. You guys can get an idea of how all this works. So basically the fan water water pump is on all the time. Fans kick on I think at 170 degrees, but I also have everything on an override switch as well. So that way, say I pull into the pits and the cars at you know say 200. Say I want to get it back down to 160. I can just sit with the water pump and the fans on and it'll cycle while the motor's off and it'll cool down really, really quickly. Gets pretty good airflow. And the nice thing about this setup is it's actually super easy to bleed uh, since it's electric water pump. Basically just turn the pump on and start adding water. It pushes the water all the way up and through and then any air that's caught in gets sent all the way to the back, caught up in here, pushed out through here. And then we're filling this with water while we're kind of checking up and filling that with water at the same time. So these caps will both be off while we're filling it. And then once this starts to get full, we just keep an eye on this and then, you know, cap that off, fill it up the rest of the way and good to go. But I mean, it stays super cool. 
doesn't have overheating issues and uh, 10 out of 10 would recommend that is my rear mount radiator setup so yeah super simple nothing very complex about it but it works really well so hopefully this helps out anybody looking to do rear mount radiator setup in the future if I had to say what my biggest recommendation is is definitely fans build a V shroud if you need to do whatever you have to do get two really big good quality fans on there none of that flexalite bullshit or $14 Amazon fans if you're buying a fan and it only comes with a 15 amp relay it's not pulling high amperage it probably ain't flowing very much air that's like 50 amps worth of fan back there but it uh it works so anyways that's gonna be it for this one like the video if you liked it subscribe to the channel if you're new follow the builds along till the next one catch you guys later